people there. But as far as before 1995 went, the Indian experience was a little bit different. In fact, quite different because people there, the Indians who came to South Africa in 159 years back came as indentured laborers. They were promised the works, but actually when they got there, they found that they were restricted and in a life of bondage, tilling the fields, denied educated education. And there was uh, a lot of discrimination between Africans, <laughs> between Africans, Indians, and the so-called whites who were Americans and Britishers. We'll talk more about it later, and then we can be over to Shreya sure. first, yeah. and then we'll carry on Let's with the dialogue. Let's give Namath the yeah. chance to introduce himself. <laughs> yes. we're, going, we're, we're doing a really free-flowing conversation in which everyone can join in eventually. But let's start with you. Yeah. Or are you doing the, are you introducing? Yeah, just right, uh, if I can. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with a huge round of applause, please welcome our next panelist, which is Mr. Namath Sadat. I'm quickly going to run you through his bio. He's the author of the novel, The Carpet Weaver. He's a prominent activist and a former journalist. He has spearheaded campaigns for LGBTQIA in Muslim communities worldwide. He's currently pursuing a master's degree in writing at John Hopkins University and working on a second novel, he, that which is a cross-genre literature novel that will appeal to readers of dystopian speculative fiction. All yours, sir. Thank you. First of all, I want to apologize because this, originally this, this, this panel discussion started at 11.30 and there was an email sent while I was <laughs> trans, uh, flying over here from Washington, D.C. and I just didn't see it until I received a phone call to rush over here, so I apologize. I hope it wasn't you know, too much Don't of a delay, but um, thank you so much for all for being here. And uh, what would you like me to say? Just make an introduction, because I'm not sure where well, you're Well, if you want, you can carry from Sarita, what we're doing is basically talking about how we sort of became diaspora writers. So, uh, where we, you know, where we came from and how we got there and how we started writing is pretty much what we're doing, aren't we, Sharbury? Sarita. Yeah. So we're just going to have like a freewheeling conversation. Yeah, yeah and then we'll. The Asian sure. experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So from my experience, you know, I lived in Afghanistan for the first eight months of my life. I was born. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, I lived in Afghanistan. I was born in Afghanistan in 1979, the year that the Soviets invaded uh, my homeland. And I left eight months after I was born. Um, we went to Germany, where my father, at that time it was West Germany, where my father was ambassador of Afghanistan uh, to Germany in Bonn. And um, in 1984, when um, the communist government recalled my father to come back to Kabul, my mom basically did a rebellious act. She didn't want me and my siblings to live in an Afghanistan of war and communism. Um, so she decided to kidnap us and take us to the United States because she wanted us to live in a free country um, and did not want us to suffer like other people had in, in our homeland. Uh, so basically, that's how my experience started. And in, in my own journey, I've also dealt with many of the issues. Um, you know, one of the editors I work, freelance editors I worked with, said that you know, in terms of the setting and scope, that my novel uh, reminds uh, her of the um, the inheritance of loss by Kiran Desai, because many of the themes, the globalization and multiculturalism, the sense of loss and identity, and trying to uh, pursue the American dream and dream and social stratifications. Those are issues that I struggled with myself and my family did. Um, and also, uh, also that's my character. So I believe one of the reasons that my novel did not get published in the United States or the UK, um, I had 450 literary rejections and dozens of publishing houses uh, basically said that my book had no literary merit or, or, or um, or market potential was because I show the hollowness of the American dream. I don't do it as intentionally as Kiran Desai does in her novel. It's just my main character, if you've read The Carpet Weaver already, the same problems he had in Afghanistan and Pakistan continue to plague him when he reaches the United States, which is what the experience is like to be a marginalized minority, to be someone who's gay and ex-Muslim, who doesn't believe in the religion, who has to reconcile his sexuality and his faith with a kind of society that wants him dead. 
Um, and then those problems continue, obviously, in Pakistan and even in the United States, which is still uh, doesn't matter regardless of the political situation, whether the liberals or conservatives or, or centrists are in power. It's still a country that was based on racial white supremacy. It's the first country that was based on that. So uh, my character is still, you know, like lingering in the space between uh, Islam and the West, Afghan and American culture, um, between gay and heterosexual. So there's trapped in a, you know, in a no man's land, you know, uh, what it means to be a native versus a refugee or an immigrant. So these are all issues that come up. And so that's how this came to be. One of the things I do want to touch on, if sure. we can, is the publishing experience in the U.S. for South Asians. Okay. You and I had like a little bit of an exchange on Facebook about it I, well, for a while ago, I think, about how uh, if we cannot fit into this perfect category by U.S. publishers as South Asian writers, then we are unequivocally rejected if, if we're writing stuff that's not palatable to what they consider to be the Western audience. It's unfamiliar. It doesn't involve arranged marriages or turmeric or saris or, you know, so they don't know what to do with that, you know? And Absolutely. so I want to talk a little bit about that because that's part of the diasporic experience. Absolutely. Well, I want to add something to that. So I only reached out to one agent here in India. Many of you might know him. His name is Kanishka Gupta from the writer's side, you know, and he's very cutting edge in the sense that um, he's, from the very first day, he committed himself to honoring diverse and distinct voices. Not that India wasn't, but a lot of um, other agents were basically, you know, trying to say, they don't want to take the risk to, you know, like, they didn't want to know, like, his, they felt like their reputation would be on the line. And Kanishka Gupta was like, no, we're, he, he's, he wanted to be the trailblazer. So it's because of people like Kanishka Gupta that give not just South Asians, but myself like an Asian. So what's interesting, he represents over 400 authors, and he also has South Asian diaspora writers in the US, in the UK, who basically tell him, look, we have been disconnected from India for one, two, or three generations, but we can't get published yeah, here. Yeah. Can we come home and get published <laughs> there? <laughs> right. And they actually do, and so Kanishka is willing to embrace them. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting, I want yeah. to He add. took a risk so, on me, too. I'm sorry? He took a risk on me, too. He's my agent. Shall I we think it's carry ready? on with the introductions? Do you want to do yours, Sharbury, and then we'll go on to mine? Hi, I'm Sharbury Ahmed. Um, I'm Bangladeshi American. I and landed up in the United States at three weeks old. Um, and uh, I'm going to date myself, but it's important to do that. It's relevant to this conversation. I'm part of a generation called Generation X. And um, one of the things about Generation X, American South Asians, is that we didn't fit in. We weren't considered American enough. And then we would, when we would come back to India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, we weren't considered Desi enough. <laughs> so we were sort of neither here nor there, you know? And now, with like my son's generation or uh, the, the next generation on of South Asians, they're a little bit more mainstreamed, a little bit more accepted. Not as much as in the UK. The US still doesn't know what to do with us. Americans still other us. Um, this is definitely exemplified in the publishing world, in the film world. I also write for television. Um, I wrote for a TV show called Quantico, which was you know, groundbreaking in the sense that they brought over this huge star. You might have heard of her, Priyanka Chopra. <laughs> And they didn't know what to do with her. She's a Bollywood star, you know? And they were like, well, what is she? I remember one of the producers asking me, Who, what is she equivalent to? And I said, Beyonce. <laughs> and they couldn't wrap their head around that, but she is, right? So, so that's part of my diasporic experience. And that has, being neither here nor there, being not white enough, American enough, um, and then coming to Bangladesh and attempting to speak Bangla, which, by the way, I do pretty well for an ABCD. <laughs> Um, you know, being a curiosity when I was in Bangladesh. Um, that informed my writing and my novel, which we'll, we'll talk about later. I want Shreya to introduce herself, but um, that definitely informed my work and the novel that I'm here attempting to promote. <laughs> Shreya, to you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shreya Sen Handley, and I'm the perennial outsider. So much so that the outsider role has become second nature. I love it, I'm comfortable in it, and I don't know if I could be anything else now. I straddle both worlds, and I think we all straddle both worlds with ease. And, and we, we've kind of carved a niche. As you know, the Indian diaspora, the Asian diaspora, has carved a niche of its own, and they're doing well in their own way. 
you, you do, you, you are always a misfit, but then I come from a family of misfit, misfits. Uh, I, I come from a Bengali literary family, um, but we have such an interesting history and we were always very peripatetic, so we've been all over the world. Sorry, uh, yeah, this is a problem I'll have to get past, you're right. I tend to wave my arms about, okay. So, uh, yeah, so um, my career started here, uh, though my childhood was all over the place. Um, I grew up in Southeast Asia and various other countries, um, and then I got into television. So uh, I was in CNBC, I made music videos for MTV, which were amazingly, they, they were popular, the, considering we were young, we were 21, 22, we didn't know what we were doing. Um, and then after that, I suddenly found myself head of Rupert Murdoch's Channel V in Eastern India. Uh, again, I was still about 24, 25 then, it was all happening really quickly. So as you do, you then suddenly implode, uh, which I did um, in terms of my career. I met an Englishman on holiday, we got married, and I found myself in Sheffield in South Yorkshire, which at the time was a kind of industrial town in decline. So uh, it wasn't the perfect place to have a sparkling media career, as I found to my shock eventually. Um, this many years down the line, I'm now, and I, and I say this with great humility as well as a lot of excitement, I'm now the first South Asian female to have written a, a major <laughs> opera. Uh, for a major international operatic house. Um, but that has taken 19 years. Mm -hmm. um, because when I first got there, and I was uh, kind of, I, because I, was in an, I found myself in an abusive marriage, uh, I found that I couldn't leave Sheffield. Perhaps if I'd been able to go on to London, there could have been things I could have done at the time. But I got into corporate communications. I first was at, found myself at the contact center after having been chief of a television station here. That didn't last long. I was the worst contact center employee ever. Um, and uh, so then I got into ease my way into corporate communications. Uh, my first husband's name was Steve. I divorced him. My second husband's name is also Steve. I'm with him. He's fantastic. Uh, they're both from Yorkshire. <laughs> they're both from Yorkshire. So every time I brought home a Steve from Yorkshire to introduce to my parents, they thought, oh no. But the second one worked out. We have two lovely children. Um, along the way, after the children were born, and I found myself at home again, I thought, well, I don't think I want to go back to corporate communications. It's not really me. It's very stiff upper lip. Um, and I started writing again. The Guardian was the first to come knocking, which was an amazing place to start. So my, my uh, journalistic career was revived little by little. I found myself writing a column for CNN India about the female body. At the time, it was very unusual for an Indian woman, this is going back six, seven years now, to be writing about Indian, uh, an Indian woman's sexuality, her body, uh, my body, your bodies, and uh, it got immensely popular to my amazement. Uh, I was actually getting more uh, footfall, more readers than the Rajdeep Sardesai, so you can imagine. Was, that, was, that was very satisfying, very gratifying. Um, then HarperCollins came and wanted to convert it into a book, and Memoirs of My Body came into being. Um, I have since written my first book of fiction um, called Strange. I won't go on about it, but I was just trying to tell you where the tragic tree was. I found that I was writing books for India, and I was writing other things like plays and eventually the opera, as I said, for England, for the West. And it feels kind of schizophrenic sometimes because you're kind of really pulled in different directions. But it's also incredibly satisfying to have that kind of double life and be appreciated in both countries. Well, it's material, too. It's copy, it is, right? It is, absolutely. I mean, it's inspiration. Yeah. And um, can I ask, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you about your publishing journey in South Africa and what it means to be South Asian in South Africa now. Well, <clears throat> my publishing in South Africa, I was published in many different anthologies. And in the newspaper, publishes me very regularly. There's a column in the Mercury newspaper, which is a very popular newspaper, and it's called the Idlers Column. So all those people who are idle, and they just like to chill and relax, and they love poetry and just a little bit of tidbits, then they read that column. But it's uh, one of the columns which is well read. As far as my publishing, I wrote this book, it was called Once Again Love, 
with the subtitle Reconnecting with the Heart. Now, when people listen to this title, they think, is it a romantic book? Did you find love once again? Yes, I did, but it was just with myself. Because after a very... Uh, I had a back operation in 2006. I fell down a flight of steps in London, and then I got up and went about things, and then it led to a back operation. And I was actually teaching Reiki and running motivational courses called The Caterpillar Flew High After It Became a Butterfly. But now, at the time of the back operation itself, I was happy. I believed in Reiki spiritual energy, sound healing. I would tell everybody that if sounding is very good for you, the body heals itself. So, for example, if you, uh, when you are a baby and you cry, you don't go la la ha ha. You just go ah, e, u, and that is the vowel sounds. And all of us make vowel sounds when we are unhappy, and that is nature's pharmacy. So the body heals. But after the, after the back operation, I came out of it in a deep, deep depression. So much so that I was suicidal. And then I started, they, nobody knew what had happened. And then I started channeling. And though, like some of my school friends are here today, my family members, Thank you for being here. And uh, I used to always write poetry. When I was in school, I would write poems about them. And uh, I started like channeling. In the morning after the back operation finished, I was in this deep depression. And I would get up in the morning <clears throat> at 3.34, and I would write copious amounts of paper. And I would keep writing. And I wrote about love, about life, about relationships about friendship and about what had happened to me and how I must live my life in an inverted V. That is, that, you know, you go up and down the crests of life like the ocean waves, but you know that you can always come up to the top and that is the apex of the V. So it's, I, I live my life like the inverted V and in money, my own natural energy yields a given treasure, heart full of pleasure and delight, happiness emanating from the soul to reach its goal, money. And that is abundance, the abundance which comes from within you. And then that spills out. Nowadays, it's known as the attitude of gratitude. It's not thinking, but it is the attachment of the emotion to the thought. And when you give gratitude with emotion, gratitude has to come. So it's not the feeling of want. The universe is bad. This one is bad to me. Wallowing in sympathy. But the fact is that you yourself are abundant and you give off abundance. Back to the question which was originally asked. Well, uh, I did try, I wanted to check and see about my publishing journey and see whether my book could be published. I sent my book to a few people, both in India and overseas, but I got no response. Then I was told that why don't you go to Amazon? And Amazon has a publishing unit called Create Space. So it is like a, a print on demand and you have different packages. I think it's now known as vanity publishing. So you pay for the package you want, and you have an editor. They are very, very efficient. They edit your work. They put it on Amazon. But I was told that I must not become a co-producer, a co-creator with them. I should then become an independent publisher, because then I have the freedom in all different countries to publish my book as I want to. Um, go on. Yes, I, was, I was just struck by something you were saying, which I think might be relevant to all of us. You were talking about love and relationships and family, and diaspora writing is so often about the connections that we have around the world. You know, the, the family here, the family there, the relationships that we build. Um, do, do you feel, do all of you feel that that is at the core of some of our, our work? It probably is of any work, but particularly because we are so distant sometimes from the things we have loved and love, continue to love. I feel so. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I, I, know, I know that um, Salman Rushdie wrote an interesting article, I believe in Slate or Salon about a decade ago about after the Kite Reiner Khalid Hosseini success, there was a lot of, um, he kind of opened the door, well, the Joy Luck Club, you know, Amy Tan opened the door in the US for Asian American literature, um, because before that there was no market, but after Amy Tan proved it, then she kind of opened up the floodgates for Asian Americans to publish their works. And Khalid Hosseini Kite Runner, regardless of how you feel about the book, he did open the, the doors uh, for diaspora writers because there was a lot more um, books that basically talked like, you know, the Septembers of Shiraz, and sh which talks about the experience of Jewish people in um, revolutionary Iran and all these kind of books have come out from various parts of, you know, Africa and Middle East and South Asia and, and Central Asia that kind of, um, uh, some in Russia was like a lot of these authors who are writing about their homelands, it's an imaginary homeland. It's a homeland that doesn't exist. It's a homeland that they fled that when at a very young age, like myself, like I, I know the golden age of the paradise loss of Afghanistan through the stories I heard from my parents, my relatives, and other Afghan Americans in the diaspora community of Southern California. But how, how accurate is my depiction? You know, and even when I went to Afghanistan after 32 years in exile, it was a war-torn version of it. You, there was some, there were some remnants in old town, in downtown Kabul, where uh, a lot of the historical uh, monuments, uh, which is still fractured and and fissured, but you could still kind of sense of what life was like. And so, you know, you're painting this thing, but it doesn't really matter because it's still fiction. You know, regardless if if, if that homeland has changed, your experiences and how you feel about it doesn't. You know, and I think that home is, is a very interesting question because where is home? You know, this is something that came up also in most of Hamid's Exit West. You know, when people, you know, this couple's trying to exit through these doors and end up in different places. But what's, what's, what's really what that, what that book really showed is kind of like um, this new definition of home because people like us as diaspora writers, we should see ourselves as an opportunity because we grew up in an international environment, we're able to bridge cultures, we're able to see things from a different lens as we have this unique experience of being an insider and outsider at the same time. We're a stranger yes. in this strange land everywhere we go and we feel this kind of dislocation and, but at the same time we see it as an opportunity because, um, because the transient nature, the fastest growing identity are people who are transnationalists, who basically are crossing about borders. And we're gonna see more of that with the climate crisis and more migration issues that are happening for other economic and social issues. Um, so I would say, you know, for me, home is uh, where I'm most happy and where I'm most at peace and where I have the most connections. So I actually wrote an, an article how, uh, why I call India home. And that was at my launch in Mumbai, it was carried in an open letter and then I, and I wrote another one I had an event in Bangalore for my, uh, um, for my book launch for the carpet weaver there, and I wrote an article and it was the subject of my speech. It was, um, coming, it was on National Coming Out Day, so we had LGBT activists talk about their experience coming out, both when um, it was still criminalized, Section 377 was still enforced, and what it was like coming out after, when now it's, it's legal. And I actually came out as Indian. I, you know, not being taboo, not being, and it's a little dramatic, but I'm just trying to say, you know, it's cool. I, what I was basically saying is, you know, um, my own experience, my homeland, being Afghanistan, has made me persona non grata because I don't follow uh, the norms of heterosexual patriarchy and because I've disavowed my religion that I was brought up in. And, um, and my uh, adopted land, which is the United States, has, I've had a very complicated relationship there because of the fact that I came of age on, uh, right after September 11 terrorist attacks and all of my identities, being a repressed homosexual, an Afghan, an American, a Muslim um, at the time, were un I felt like I was under siege and had to constantly prove my loyalty, I had to prove that I was worthy, I was to prove all these different things. Um, so I guess for me, you know, like in, in my adopted line, I'm still not published, you know, even though here, this book, you know, in four months, we've sold almost 5,000 copies. We've gotten, uh, you know, it's the most written about book for debut fiction in 2019 in India. 
unanimously very positive reviews, the books, the blogger community, but it's like, I'm still not good enough for white people. Yeah. And then people are like, but the US is a multicultural society, but the gatekeepers are still white or whitewashed. There are even um, South Asian <laughs> uh, agents who rejected me, yeah. for, and the reason they gave was the same reason as a white person would give. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about a little bit about what you said about enjoying being a misfit. And I yeah. really, really love that because yeah. for me, I was uncomfortable for a very long time. My name is Shari, which is a very Bengali name, but you can imagine in the US they massacred it. Oh, and somebody even called me Sharabi, which is very problematic. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't like it for so long. I changed my name to Sharon, which was very confusing. <laughs> to my mother. Sharon is a horrible, it's not a horrible name, I'm sorry, but it's so plain compared to Charbery. But I was always trying to fit in. I was always trying to, and I just couldn't. I felt, I kept getting rejected. And, and the thing is, it's wonderful because it prepared me for a life of writing. <laughs> Rejection is part and parcel of the writer's experience. We have to become intimate with it and we have to get comfortable with it. And there's levels of rejection. So I feel like the misfit thing is, yeah. is very much preparation for rejection. But rejection does not ha is not a failure in any way. It's about adaptation. It's about versatility. It's about flexibility. You know, um, and that, that leads to more creative versatility. Yeah and adaptation and openness. Um, people ask me, what is your inspiration? And I think people have this notion that inspiration is a lightning bolt, you know? And no, it's work. You, it, it, part of being a writer is observing, eavesdropping. You know, I'm watching all of you <laughs> from up here. I'm constantly watching, I'm a writer, you know? So, I'm, yeah. so that's part of You're it. You're all the rest for the mail. You're all gonna end up in my, I don't know. But, you know, so I yeah. love that you, were you like that as a child though? The misfit stuff, oh, were you absolutely. comfortable? Yeah. That's wonderful, I, I was think, not like that, Shreya, sure, so you know, I really the, admire that. Yeah, the flexibility and yes. versatility you talk about is very much the mark of the diaspora writer. Yes. Because what we are, we're shape shifters. Yes, we have to beautiful. Be. We have we to are. be shape shift, wherever we are, we, do, we stand out even as we fit in. So I think we've always done that. I mean, whether I was here, but feeling rather out of place even in India at the time. Because my childhood had been in the Philippines, and I was uh, a bit too American. Then I moved to the UK, and then I was perceived as a bit too Indian. Uh, but all the time knowing that I was neither American nor Indian nor British or anything else. And you were you. I was me. Um, yeah. Uniquely you. Yes, yes. Yes, and, and names. Names are important yes. as well. So I've, I've been called all sorts of things, the same sure. sort of things, Sherry and Sharon and She-Ra, you know, He-Man and the Masters of the <laughs> Universe, that's the one I like best, She-Ra, so I was yeah. finally a superhero. Um, and eventually, my, uh, my name is Shreo Shi Sen, but I became Shreya Sen Hungry, and it was organic. It's not that I grew, you know, woke up one morning and said, I'll call myself Shreya. It actually happened here in Delhi, because Shreya Shi couldn't be pronounced by the people here either. So I became Shreya here, and as I went along and dropped surnames and picked up new ones, as I told you about my many marriages too, actually. Uh, so I became Shreya Sen Handley. Um, so it, it's a part of our identity to... But you know, another thing you're saying, and I'm, I'm curious what everybody else thinks, yeah. this shape-shifting is, is wonderful, it's out of, but there's a downside to it, at least for me personally. Um, I'm found but nobody was adjusting to me. And um, this recently, I live in a very white town. I live in a town called Darien, Connecticut, and I really, really love it. But it's very heteronormative, very, very homogenous, very, very conservative white town. And a lot of my friends are white. Um, they're almost all of them blonde. Not real, by the way, <laughs> fake blonde, but blonde. <laughs> so there's an Aryan um, proclivity. <laughs> And um, I found myself starting to, re to not want to hang out with these people anymore. <laughs> I'm used to white people. I'm very comfortable around white people. But I realized somebody put my friend, Ridu Gulati, who's an ABCD like me, she pointed out to me, she goes, you know, we're always adjusting to them. They're never adjusting to us. So when we speak up, when we say something, 
in protest, when we call something out as perhaps racist or colonial or the colonial gaze or we talk, I have a lot of British friends, so I give them a hard time about the British Raj. I will not back down from the British Raj. Anybody tells me anything good about Winston Churchill, they're gonna <laughs> get an <laughs> earful yeah. from me. Yeah. Okay, I'm never backing down from this. But I used to back down, and now I'm speaking up more, and I'm labeled the angry brown person. <laughs> I am immediately, oh, there goes Sharbri again with her Winston Churchill rant, and <laughs> the thing is, what Winston Churchill did, what the British Raj did, we're still feeling the effects of. It did not go away. The famines, the degradation, the theft, you know, they stole from us, right? And they're still holding on to a lot of the things they stole. Now I'm speaking up and I'm getting a lot of pushback. And I realize it's because I adjusted for too long. And that is the downside of the diaspora because we are so adaptable. And we tend to be losing ourselves in the process. We have to be careful. So that also informs my writing. I'm exploring that now more and more yeah. in my writing. That's so very interesting, you know, what you are talking about. Because I grew up in India. I grew up in India, had an Indian education. And then I went to Nigeria, and there we were known as the white people. They used to call us Oibo. Oibo meant white. So, and, they, and I also then joined a uh, book club uh, with African and Caribbean literature, but it was run basically by the Dutch, uh, Dutch people, Americans, and it had a few Nigerian authors, and I realized that the Indian education is actually very good. And uh, being in Nigeria and interacting with all kinds of people, with Africans, with Indians, and with the so-called, like what in South Africa we call them whites. Anyone who's American or European or even Jewish is called white because that's the color of their skin. So in Nigeria, I discovered that I must be proudly Indian. And that helped me because when I went to South Africa, South Africa, the uh, you know, we were treated as the exotic people because we came from India, but not. But at the same time, Indians who went there many years be before, as I had said, were treated badly, and they had this experience that we are, first we weren't white enough, and now we are not black enough. And they were constantly trying to fit in, because first they used to say that first, you know, they were, because of apartheid, the center of the city, the beautiful beaches, everything was for Americans and Europeans. The Indians were then shifted further away from the city. Then we had what they called the colored, which was a mix of, uh, you know, the African people married to Americans or Britishers. So they had this funny name, which was called colored. And then they were the township people, which were the Africans. And I always just felt that I'm very happy that, you know, I have my identity as an Indian and I can feel strong in that. Because people, South Africans of Indian origin, constantly had to prove that they were South African. And that, yes, their loyalty, as, you know, as Nimit said, that their loyalty lives and belongs to South Africa. We are not from India, we are, because otherwise they'd feel that we are not belonging to India, we haven't grown up there, we don't belong to South Africa, so what are we? So they, people there were facing an identity crisis, which they are said like shapeshifters. Which makes me think, I want to put yeah, the question I, to I you. Wanna, go on, you go on first. I mean, you said, and you yeah. said, it's very interesting because um, intersectionality of identities is a good thing and it also can be very complicated. I recently, uh, you know, one of my ways of coming to India is hosting Airbnb, having Airbnb guests come stay at my place. So I have people from all over the world. Um, this year I had the privilege of meeting an Indian from South Africa, um, and she basically told me that her ancestors were brought over as slaves centuries ago from India by the British to South Africa to build this nation <laughs> of South yeah, Africa. 159 years ago. 159 years ago, mm -hmm. there you go. So she was telling me that that's her roots and she's very proud of it. And she says she gets it from both sides. She's telling me that um, obviously she gets discrimination f to this day from white people, but um, that basically black people tell her and people like her that you are our oppressors because now Indians in the last, since post-apartheid, they've reached, uh, they were able to attain high levels of education and reach the top levels of government. So they said yeah. that 
It, and I felt, I was like, that is so ridiculous. That's like Native Americans, indigenous Americans in the United States accusing African Americans who were at the front lines of civil liberties for all minorities, accusing them being the oppressors. So I just thought that was a very interesting thing of how identity is so complicated, yeah. both within countries and internationally. And um, for some, for people like us, from here, like you said, you lived in, in, in India and Nigeria, and it's, it's very complicated when you're moving all the time. There's so many, it's like a juggling act. Um, and I want to get back to what you were saying, two things that you mentioned, the gay and the rejection. Rejection is very powerful. Um, one of the reasons I started writing this book in um, 2008 was I was empowered by Barack Obama. Uh, winning the Democratic nomination, uh, securing it, be beating uh, Hillary Clinton. I figured if a biracial black man can, can win the nomination for a major political party, given the history of slavery and racism in the United States, um, that I can too can write this novel. But it was also a history of a rejection of unrequited love, experiencing that myself, rejection after it once. So rejection is a very powerful tool to help you become a writer in, 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 in anything. Uh, as a motivating force. And the thing, the gaze is very interesting because you mentioned the white gaze, which Toni Morrison and other authors, I mean, going back to like W.E.B. Du Bois and the uh, Souls of Black Folk, he talks about that. Um, writing, knowing what other people think. And I think it's so cavalier. Um, I've said, you know, people are like, you know, this, is, this book is too dangerous because you're both, you're not considering the Islamic gaze. You're not considering the white gaze. You're not, I said, no. You have to yeah. ignore all yes. those gazes. <laughs> you know, if you want to write, if you want to try write fiction, which journalism tries to search for the truth, I think fiction, writing a novel, has to go to the more deeper underlying truths that we don't get a chance to do in our Twitter or fast news pace culture. And I figured, like, if you want to tell the best truth possible, but also, really, your your story, your narrative is about storytelling and art. But if you really want to, like, there's two aspects. You know, when you're writing a novel. The showing is the art, but the telling of writing fiction is the political and philosophical. So if you really want to get to the root of what it is, you really can't consider, you have to be, uh, it has to be unfiltered, it has to be robust, uninhibited, and wide open. And so I really, I pride really you. applaud you for writing this book. I really do. And in South Africa, there's a novelist, and she's a Muslim lady, and she's written a book called The Middle Cracked, and it's also tackling this issue. You but know, I, bisexuality and sexuality, and so often we suppress these very, uh, I, I'll use the word profound, but for people who are gay, there are people who are transgender, it is part of their life. So why should they hide it? And why should not, we not be open about it and tackle, as we tackle racism, we must uh, embrace all of society. Yeah, unfortunately, it's dangerous for a lot of people in the LGBT, even in the United States. The, the major, the, so many trans women are being murdered and attacked in the United States. I mean, you're, you're, we're not hearing about it. We need to hear about it more, but that's actually happening. We're still so backward in so many ways. But you know? now we are stepping forward. We are stepping forward. Is that the bell, so, the warning bell? Yeah, we're, I think we're living in a world, one, one quick comment I want to add to that. We're living in a world that is really split on the issue of LGBT rights. We have one world that is basically, half the world is moving towards full LGBT equality, gay marriage, and then we have this other world where in 68 countries where they're living in an open air prison, in Siltan and Brunei where they just reinstituted stoning of LGBT people, in Chechnya province of Russia where we have um, you know, concentration camps where gay people are being tortured to death. And we said never again after Hitler sent them to concentration camp. But we're living in a world and every, life goes on. Nobody really cares. Nobody's trying to... And then and obviously in, under, in Islamic countries, under Sharia law, yeah. we know how horrific it is. I mean, labels are so interesting. Before we move on, and we all want to throw the floor open to all of you, I just wanted to say, um, and I don't know whether we'll get the chance to talk about this much. Perhaps we'll carry on afterwards. But... Labels is a huge part, whether it's a, the sexual label of who we are or it's a racial label. And, even in, and those labels constrict what we can do and what we can't do. For example, I mean, I've mentioned the fact that I write books, fiction and nonfiction, for the Indian readership mainly. And I write plays and the opera for um, 
for, for the West, and, and different, there are different expectations there. For example, even with opera, and I've got, uh, there's this, it's, it's going to be hopefully pretty major, it's coming out next year. But what I've, I've had to start with an acceptable subject, which is migration. So my first opera, though it's very, hopefully very different from traditional opera and anything that's been written before, with modern Indian characters for the first time in so opera. What's it called? It's, it's called Migrations. Oh, At this okay. moment, it's called Migrations. It'll be premiered with Prince Charles in attendance. All of that is wonderful. But remember that the first step was to write about who I was, migrations, about Indian doctors in the NHS. Perhaps the next step, and there is another opera on the way, is going to be about, I'm actually going to be allowed to write about anybody, I feel like, and I'm going to be writing about a Welsh mining town. But the first step is always writing about what they want you or expect you to write about. And it was about that migration. It, that's so interesting. It's about making them feel comfortable. And I'm frankly getting weary of making them feel comfortable. <laughs> I, want them to, I want to make them uncomfortable now. And, um, and I'm, I'm committed to that. Yeah. And, and I've done that, so you can take the subject now you're, you're doing given, it. now you're doing and what you even want. with migration, I've made them very uncomfortable because I've talked about Enoch Powell and Rivers of Blood, and it's about how the migra migrants have been treated. Uh, there is comedy, and they're fully with it. You know, even as we say, oh, the white gays and what opportunities are given to us or not, but then they, there will be those organizations that will come along and will say, yeah, I think we want the British, to hear your point I think the British are a little ahead of the Americans in and that and regard. That's, even though it's Winston Churchill land, that's entirely possible. I think it's all about life is about love and relationships. The relationships we have with ourselves first, then with each other as communities, nationalities. And we also wanted to throw the floor open yes. to the audience. Yes. 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 Any and questions? if the audience has any questions, so can give him give them the microphone, yes, please. Please. Yes, please. Um, so I have two questions actually, but the first one is that: uh, Do you feel that with the current generation, the experience has been different because of all these uh, mass media and social media and so much of connectivity? where a child even in a village in India is connected to something that might be happening to a child in the USA or for example the climate activists and you know how kids in India have also taken up the same cause. So will their experience be very different from what I'm yours was? I'm going to say something very briefly before I... Uh, even though there's connectivity, don't you feel in many ways we all live in echo chambers? Yes, it's yeah. becoming very... It's also becoming very fragmented, very postmodern. I had very young millennials who have reached out to me, um, you know, early 20s, and they're like, thank you for writing a book, because I'm a Generation X. So I, they're like, you know, I feel like I'm a bridge between, the, um, between millennials and the, and, and the baby boomers. Because the, genera the millennials, they don't remember that world when we just had passive media newspaper or one television program on television and we'd watch and that would basically be our thing and we would spend most of our time with social connections with people not yeah. On, yeah. on so they don't remember that world so they see a glimpse of this world in my novel and they are like they're fascinated by it because they're like now it's like they kind of miss it they feel nostalgic for it and i think that's very fascinating when you have millennials who are saying that you know they're tired of this fragmented bit by bit piece by piece uh, life and they want to like f get a dose of that so um, so I yeah I do agree that th we are moving ahead and but we are also there's other things that are setting us back at the same time yes absolutely uh, the second question which I had is that uh, just as you're saying that you know there are some children or the younger generation looking up to you did you uh, each one of you have someone who you looked up to uh, for your struggles uh, to be as a motivation, to be successful? For me, it was my parents. I really looked up to my parents. I, I was, I'm very blessed with the parents that I have, you know. Um, you know, they're Bengali and they're Muslim, but they're very liberal Muslim. And when I went to them and I announced I wanted to be a writer, being Bengalis, they were overjoyed, <laughs> you know. Well, for other people, it's like, saying, I want to be a prostitute. <laughs> but for my Bengali parents are like, wonderful, but get your masters. 
you know? Oh. So there was a, there was a desi yeah. caveat, but you know, so I just look at my parents and the way they just came over, you know, and to the US and my mother in my little town in Connecticut where there was no people of color, we were the only brown people. My mother would flounce around in saris. She refused to wear anything else. And she, she never adjusted to anybody. She made people adjust to her. <laughs> so um, I really, and my dad, you know, he was, uh, and only now I'm realizing this. So he was, he, got, he moved up pretty quickly in the, U, in the UN. And you think that's a great thing, but I want you to picture a brown man heading a big UN agency office with many, many white people under him. Your dad was in the UN? Yes. My granddad was in the UN. Yeah. See, the things you find out is sitting here yeah. in the panel. <laughs> <tunnel. laughs> Recently, my father told me how much I asked him about it, because he never talked about it. There was a lot of pushback to his authority. A lot of white people under his authority didn't like, feel comfortable you know, um, taking orders from a, directives from a man of color. And you can imagine, this is in the 80s and 90s, so it was even worse. So I really, I think I look up to them. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, my creative role models were all white or black. For me as well, yes. Not that's, South that's Asian. just how it was. Yeah, yeah. just how it was. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for me, I would say um, Oscar Wilde because he not only was he a playwright and a novelist and such a talented artist, but he was also an activist. I mean, he was put in prison. He was out. And he was out openly gay men. In the 1890s. Yes. In 1890 yes. when it was, they, the, like the buggery jailed. laws and sodomy yes. laws were still in effect in Victorian England. So he kind of, people say, you know, he kind of paved the way for England and Ireland and the, that region, the UK, to get the thing. So me being the first Afghan to come out, I feel like that he inspired me because I'm an activist artist. I came to art as an activist and I evolved as an artist. And, and then also James Baldwin, you know, being a gay black man, yeah. uh, writing Giovanni's Room and his experience. I mean, in his lifetime, he did not get the recognition he deserved. He had to go live in exile in France where they honored him, his genius. And today, now in creative writing programs across the United States, in fiction or nonfiction, you read James Baldwin. You really, you really yeah. can't not read him. Yeah. And so I think James Baldwin's amazing. Um, and he also didn't have, he had tr struggled with relationships. He went to France of all places and they overlooked his skin color or you know, his physical characteristics and they found, his, they found attraction to him. They were attracted yeah. to his soul, his intelligence and, yeah. and other things. So you know, um, I still think uh, continental Europe is more evolved than the United States. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably right. Do you want to talk a little bit about your inspiration? And then we should move on to some other yeah, questions, uh, I think. Yeah. Well, basically, like both of them, it was a combination of reading, writing heroes, people I grew up reading. They were predominantly white. It did shape my imagination, which is why I found slipping into the British way so very easy, quite honestly. But also it was my family who gave me the strength to be those two or three, five, seven, eight different people that I am and that they're comfortable with it makes it easier. They didn't make the trip with me. I was a migrant on my own, but they were always right behind me and that made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. We have a few, you yeah, had a question in the front. Yeah. Hello. No, uh, you are all diaspora writers, right? Yes. And India, um, we have many writers such as N. C. Choudhury, V. S. Naipaul, do not non-fiction category like you write, I mean, uh, fiction write you category. My question is this, those people like Naipaul or N. C. Choudhury, there are many of them, I, I have read particularly these two. Uh, how do you compare, if you have read them, how do you think about them? And how do you compare yourself, your generation, with them? Uh, Naipaul, um, I have a lot of thoughts on <laughs> V.S. Naipaul. Um, I frankly feel he was a colonial apologist, so, and uh, quite misogynistic. So I'm not comparing myself to V.S. Naipaul in any way, shape, or form. I think all these authors, they're all good, like, but, um, each one of us is individualistic. So we are writing about ourselves. So when we write, we are writing, and so is Shalbari, Shreya, Neemat, we are writing from our personal experiences. 
And as they said that, you know, like they are observing all of you. So wherever authors go, wherever writers go, they observe people, the characteristics of people, the events. And uh, so a writer's role is not to compare with anybody because each one of us is uniquely us. So we are writing about ourselves and our experiences and the relationships we have with those around us. I mean, my current book is called Strange, and it's all about the bizarre turns that our lives can take. As a migrant, I'm particularly well-placed to be writing about something like that. And I think as a diaspora writer, we all live in democracies in the West, so we are also a very politicized group. Um, and for me, both as a gay man and a, as a member of the diaspora community, so we're kind of pawns, you know, by the, the you know, by the different political factions in the countries we live in, who are basically trying to compete for our votes and to stay in power. So there will, there's, there's a lot of the jockeying and jostling around with our identities and trying to define and box us in into different categories. So we have to be able to be control of our narrative. Yeah. And we're not going to let anyone define us. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so I think, oh, a lot of questions. That lady in, with the, in the orange dopatta. Hi. Actually, my question is quite generic. You know, I kept hearing things about how the diaspora writers had to conform or try to fit in or placate people to get published. But I think this is more of a universal problem, the, the chauvinistic, the West exists for many, at very many levels, even for those who are willing, you know, who are putting up their works for prizes. Uh, for example, you have to, if uh, you have to be an apologist, if you write something pro-East, pro-thing, your, your book is definitely not going to feature for a Booker's Prize or something like that. So it's, it's not only about diaspora. I think it is just that they are that way. I mean, the West is that way, particularly America. Yeah. What do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 what you're talking about is what Nimeth and I are facing as American South Asian writers. Americans aren't quite ready for us yet. Even though we're American, <laughs> they don't, we're not the American they're used to. So no, the chances, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what makes a booker or doesn't make a booker. I think it's quite subjective, uh, ultimately. Um, but yeah, is there a trend towards writing that's a bit more palatable to the West? Probably, I would imagine. Um, but the Booker is British, it's not American, yeah. Yeah. so. Um, I don't know, Jhumpa Lahiri won the Pulitzer. Um, but the way it works in the US is they're like, oh, okay, we ticked off that box. Exactly. Yeah. So we're done. No more South Asians are gonna win Pulitzers until we deem them palatable. So that's I think the issue. I, I, I think that there is, there is, people do fear me and my writing because I'm empowering too many people. Uh, right now, white people, heterosexual, especially men, feel that they're endangered species in the United States because they're seeing minorities um, in the United States and the, col the former colonies around the world who are now independent rising up and being competition for them in terms of shaping the narrative. So I feel like my book, I'm empowering too many people. If Let's say, for example, I light a fire in readers for this book in the US, and I empower, I'm empowering LGBT people, and brown people, and Muslim people, and ex-Muslim people, and immigrants, and refugees. That's just too many people. And we see that um, if all those voices got out and that all those books were commercially viable, yeah. they, and then basically what that does is it, it, it puts the heterosexual white man in the backseat that the dominant culture becomes you know, the, uh, less important that the subculture becomes the dominant culture. Yeah. And this is why uh, Weimar Germany, why gays and lesbians and Jews and other minorities were the dominant culture and the Nazis resented it. Yeah. So this is, that's exactly what happened there. Berlin was at the forefront of gay rights yes. and, and don't believe that Stonewall is where the revolution happened. Actually, Weimar Germany had legal protections and, and uh, gay and lesbian transgender culture was the most uh, advanced in Germany and, and at the yeah. time. And we know the same thing here in India. Yeah. So there's a lot of whitewashing that takes place. If I could just be very quickly d play devil's advocate here and say that having to fit a mold or a label is not a Western problem alone. 
uh, wh whether as a person, as a woman in India, there'll be certain things you'll be allowed to write about and certain things you won't. It may not be explicitly said what you can, but you always know it. So it, it isn't a Western problem alone, and it's not even a writer's problem alone. Uh, we all know that. But definitely, wherever you are in the world, there are certain things boxes you have to tick, and being able to step outside of that is, is what makes us creative. Uh, yes, I don't know. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> right over there. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm from Nagpur. So my question is to you, sir. You were a former journalist. Uh, so who is your favorite journalist, Arnab Goswami or, or Rajdeep Sardesai? <laughs> And uh, what kind of advice uh, do you want to give to the Indian journalists so that after general election 2019? Okay. Well, I would say um, my favorite journalist, um, I want, always wanted to be a foreign correspondent, so definitely Christian Amanpour. I definitely, really, you know, she's at the forefront, person who basically w w was in the trenches and, you know, when former uh, Yugoslavia was breaking apart and, um, you know, was at the front lines and always covering the story, so definitely. And, uh, sh and she also has an interview with me when the Orlando massacre happened. So I had the privilege of working with her when she left CNN and was at ABC News Nightline. And I definitely have to say uh, Fareed Zakaria. Uh, he actually, I want to say one more comment that um, about how everywhere I worked, Indians opened the door for me, not only to get published here, but even in the United States, it was uh, an Indian who, uh, Natasha Singh, who interviewed me and hired me at ABC News Nightline. I worked at CNN Fareed Zakaria show when the Orlando massacre happened. I had hundreds of contacts and I wanted to go on, on, on the news and speak because here we had Democrats talking about the mass shootings and Republicans were talking about, uh, you know, like how we're going to pr protect LGBT community from foreign Islamic terrorism because we only want white supremacists to kill LGBT, not those Muslim people. <laughs> so basically, um, I, Fred Zakari is the one who basically pitched me and made sure that I got on CNN. And so like, and, and I, can give, I, have, I can give many examples of how diaspora Indians actually helped me. You know, like my, my Oxford thesis advisor was a Chatterjee and my acquisitions editor here was also a Chatterjee. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the Bengali. But yeah, so basically, so that's very important. I mean, um, there's a reason why that there's a connection that they really feel that my voice really needed to get out there. Um, so to answer your question, um, those are my journalists that I, I, I give my salutes to. Yeah. Can we have one last question from the lady there? She's been If we can't fit another wheel, we will fit. Uh, hi, writers are always great thinkers. Now, I have just one single question to ask. What do you think um, are the prospects of climate change protesters trying to, you know, make a point to the policymakers and the government that this is real in the light of the COP25 summit? Please, thank you. Want to, who wants to answer that one? Okay, actually, I didn't hear it I clearly. Can you, can you repeat yeah, the repeat question that, that and speak into to the to microphone? Yeah, is it better? Is it better now? Yeah. Now, writers are always great thinkers, so I want your take on the climate change issue that is coming up in 20, um, COP25. Why protesters are not uh, you know, listened by the governments, and why, what can the Main Street do? Thanks. Well, in the United States, um, the Trump administration is um, solidly committed to denying <laughs> climate change. Um, they have cut uh, aid to the Environmental Protection Agency. They have um, allowed, re-allowed fracking. They are, um, they have withdrawn from various international treaties. So um, the United States is in dismal shape concerning climate change. Um, and uh, so all we can do is continue talking about it, uh, arming the public with facts, uh, and uh, protesting as much as possible, and writing about it. And absolutely, this is something that you're gonna see, in fiction, you're gonna see more and more novels and stories dealing with climate change.
and the after effects of it, definitely. In South Africa, climate change is being taken very, very seriously. There are lots of books being devoted to it, especially uh, targeted at school children because they are the real game changers. And um, in Diwa at Diwali time, a couple of months before Diwali, people start protesting about the use of fireworks because of uh, the environmental uh, damages, but also because of noise. And uh, Westerners, white people are very worried that their pets will get lost and frightened because of Diwali. So they are the three things. So more of, uh, like I always think of noise pollution, climate change, but the protests are that look after your pets and stop the fireworks. But besides that, fracking, as uh, Shadbiri just mentioned, uh, that's being disallowed, and there's a lot of environmental protection, and there are laws being implemented out there, and there's protest action also taking place. And I would just say I'm an ethical vegan, so I would promote uh, veganism for everyone in the crowd because you can reduce your carbon footprint and help the environment in addition to helping the rights of non-human animals and improving your health because fending off against Alzheimer's and cancer and diabetes, so you're reducing health care. So you're targeting climate crisis, the health crisis, and also expanding civil liberties to non-human animals. Do we have time for one last question? There was a Okay. Oh, gosh. You choose. <laughs> okay. Actually, you must be all aware, human life left on this planet is only 100 years. After 100 years, human will disappear from this earth. Please take note of this, all of you. <laughs> it took nature one million years to raise CO2 level to 200 ppm. Human being, Within 100 years, we have raised to 420 ppm. No rain in South Africa last three years. Temperature in Rajasthan reached 54 degrees centigrade. The BSF soldiers were frying pepper in the sand. Himalayan glaciers have melted. The sea level will rise three and a half feet. Where will you rehabilitate millions from Kerala? We are closing our eyes. We don't want to know anything. Really, I have a report from UNO. The Trump was discussing 1.5 degree rise by end of this century. In fact, it will rise by 3.5 degrees. We would neither have water nor food. We are... Cl Question is simple. You will survive human race in 100 years. It disappear from this earth. It took nature one million years to... We agree with you. We do. We I agree the, with you 100%. But I we am need the a oldest living ITN of India, BTEC from IIT Bombay, MTEC from Imperial College London, worked for UNO on this climate change. You are sleeping, you are working for your son, grandson, but you are not thinking of climate. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, there's a question right there. Oh, no more time. No more time. Is, is, is it a very quick question? Can we fit it in? Okay, okay. sure. As diaspora writers, do you start up with an inherent liability of having to prove uh, your native way you're settled right now plus the Indian audience back home? And if so, how do you tackle that? I think we've kind of covered that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and that's honestly what we've been talking about. Yeah, I'm, I have to doubly prove myself, but you know, in the United States, being a woman and of color, I've got that double whammy where I have to work harder. You know what? I don't. <laughs> I just create. I just tell my stories. Um, I told you rejection is so much a part of our experience as human beings and writers, so I just have to keep on going. If I dwell too much about this, it will paralyze me, so I try not to think about it. You just have to keep going, and that's a good life lesson, by the way. That's not just about writing, yeah. you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Last question from this uh, no. in the black Yes. Yeah. Then after that, no more questions. Oh, dear. I don't think there's... I don't think there's time for many questions. Hello. You know, the political profile of Indian diaspora has changed, has become more pronounced, thanks to Mr. Prime Minister Modi. 
what is the impact of this in the local society where you are living? And the second question, what is the impact of this on your writing? You know, the political profile, the increasing political profile of Indian diaspora all over the world. Well, you would think that it would help us if the profile is increasing, but um, as a Muslim, uh, I'm not sure, you know, my profile would increase. <laughs> You know, I'm, and I consider myself an American. So, I mean, I think that India is taken far more seriously now. Uh, economically, it's a powerhouse. Um, creatively, you know, it, it con it, it's contributing, its contributions to uh, the entertainment industry in the United States is increasing. So I think it's a good, it's a, it's a good thing um, that the Indian profile is increasing. And it does help me, I guess, ultimately. Can I just um, end on the note that, as we know, the whole world is swinging to the right. And as outsiders and creatives, we're all trying to find that balance and that space for all of us. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank Nicely you put. very much. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.